Chris Sununu. All right. All right. Look at this crowd. Look at this. Holy cow. You guys excited? You should be. This is amazing. Oh, this is great. We got some energy. We got three days to go. And all of America is watching. And wait till they see what New Hampshire does to, to Donald Trump. It's going to be very exciting. There is momentum out there. Now, I've obviously been with Nikki for the last week, crisscrossing the state. This is like, no joke, like our 10th event today. We're going to diners. We're doing town halls. We're doing rallies. We're over on the seacoast. We were down in Milford. And now we're here in the heart of the state, in the queen city of Manchester, where people are excited. It has been fun. Look, the energy is real. There's obviously a lot of energy in this room. The energy is real. The momentum is real. Um, we've always said one of the keys to this race is making sure we have a really high voter turnout, right? Iowa had like, like 50,000 people or something vote for Trump. 50,000 out of 3 million. Is that going to dictate the choice of the Republican Party in this country? <laughs> Hell no! I don't think so. This is where it happens. And Dave Scanlon, our illustrious Secretary of State, came out today said we are go Republican Party is going to break records on Tuesday with voter turnout, which is really exciting. That means people want change. They're not accepting the incumbent. They're not accepting yesterday's news. They want change, and they know what happens here. They know that Nikki is a strong conservative, did amazing things in South Carolina. She was a governor, and I am pretty, par par pretty partial to governors, as you know. We get stuff done. Governors get stuff done. Accountability in government. Um, those are three words that are pretty rare in Washington, D.C., right? With the idea that someone's going to hold Congress accountable. She's going to work. She's going to manage. They do not make excuses. When you talk about building a wall, we were promised that. Still waiting for the wall to be built, Donald. I'm still waiting for that border to be secured. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. Let's get someone in there that knows how to get it done. <laughs> Fiscal responsibility. I remember he was in that debate. And he said, with, with Hillary Clinton, he said, I'm going to be the most fiscally responsible Republican this country has ever seen. What a joke. It was like he was doing stand-up at Chuckles. It was an absolute joke. This guy, hey, he lowered business taxes. That's great. He made tax cuts. We all said, this is terrific. And then he borrowed seven and a half trillion dollars to back it up. That's like saying to your family, look at this beautiful house we bought. I just paid for it on a credit card. It's the dumbest thing you can do. And by the way, that is not government debt. That is your debt. That is my debt. That is our kids' debt. We are paying that back, right? So let's appreciate what they've put on us. But to have someone in the White House that understands that accountability, someone that's been the United Nations ambassador, with more understanding of these detailed, complex issues at a time when world matters have never, never been more important to America to making sure we're strong internationally, to make sure there's world peace through America's strength. She understands that better than all these knuckleheads put together. It's awesome. It is awesome. So... The, I'm gonna, uh, the most important thing is this. You guys are excited. You get it. You're energized, right? Go talk to your friends. Go talk to your neighbors. Get them out to vote. Everything is about getting, the, the, getting more people out to vote. If you think Donald Trump is a threat to democracy, don't sit on your couch and not participate in democracy. You gotta go vote, right? If you appreciate that Nikki is the most conservative Republican out there that knows how to get stuff done, right? And, and not just wins in electability, the White House, by 10%, but m better than Donald Trump, actually wins the House, the Senate, the governorships. Do you know since 2016, here in New Hampshire, federal races, Republicans are 0 for 11 with Donald Trump at the top. I am sick of that. These are our seats. We got to win these things back. And Nikki at the top brings the entire party along, right? We are tired of losing. Republicans are tired of losing. We're tired of losers. We're tired of Donald Trump. We're going to galvanize this party. We're going to bring the country together. Let's bring out the person that's going to do it. She's the governor. She's the ambassador. She's really my best friend lately. Miss Nikki Haley.
always great to see. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So I'm cracking up because your governor like, had way too many Red Bulls today. Like, I don't know what the... But he is such a fun friend. We've had a great time through this process. You know what I love is I love the relationship he has with Granite Staters. I love the fact that... Give him applause. I mean, it really is. He tells you the truth. He fights for you. He really does understand you got to be with the people, not with those that are in elected office. You got to be with the people. And he's done that. And we have been all over this state multiple times. And so when we started and we were trying to, you know, get together and he decided to endorse me, you know, I love music. You were listening to my playlist. I love music. And, you know, he got to pick his song that he wanted to come out to. So I hadn't, nobody told me what his song was. And so we're standing there, I'm standing right behind him. And all of a sudden, Welcome to the Jungle comes on. And I looked at him and I was like, nice. That's really nice. So, no, he's been great. You're blessed to have him as your governor. So it's great to be here. There's a lot going on. All eyes are on New Hampshire three days until you vote, which we're super excited about. We have spent 11 months campaigning across the state, doing multiple town halls, answering questions, shaking hands, being the last person to leave. And I know I'm excited because it's coming down to where we move the country. I know why you're excited. Because in three days, no more commercials, no more mail, no more text messages. <laughs> I know you're excited. How many of you have heard me speak at a town hall before or have not heard me speak at a town hall? How many are new? To so quite a few. Good. Well, we're glad you came out. So look, when you look at the situation that we have in our country, it's not great. And you don't have to turn on the news to see that. We are $34 trillion in debt. We're having to borrow money just to make our interest payments. China owns some of that debt. Now, I would love to tell you that Biden did that to us. And he sent us down this roller coaster of socialism that's dangerous, and we've got to stop it. But I have always spoken in hard truths, and I'm going to do that with you today. Our Republicans did that to us, too. You go back and look at that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill that they passed with no accountability, that expanded welfare that's now left us with 80 million Americans on Medicaid, 42 million Americans on food stamps. And think about it. Congress has one job, one job, and that's to pay for government on time. Do you know they've only given a budget on time four times in 40 years? Four times in 40 years. You know what I say to that? You don't give us a budget on time, you don't get paid. It's that simple. <laughs> When I get to the White House, we will stop the spending, we'll stop the borrowing, we'll eliminate their pet projects, and I'll veto any spending bill that doesn't take us back to pre-COVID levels. That will save us trillions. The second thing... The second thing is we're going to take as many federal programs from D.C. and send them down to the state level. That way we'll reduce the size of the federal government and empower people on the ground. Think education, think welfare, think health care, think mental health. If we do that, we make a dramatic difference. Right now, 70% of federal employees are still working from home after three years after COVID. 75% of most of our agencies are sitting empty. We're paying for that. We've got to bring some sanity back to the process. Don't you think it's time we finally have an accountant in the White House?
And we're watching the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We want to open up the middle class. That's why we want to eliminate the federal gas and diesel tax in this country. We want to cut taxes on the middle class and simplify the brackets. And we want to make the small business tax cuts permanent. They made corporate tax cuts permanent, but they made small business tax cuts temporary. Small businesses are the heartbeat of our economy. It's about time we show them that. When it comes to education, this is chilling. Only 31% of eighth graders in our country are proficient in reading. Only 27% of eighth graders are proficient in math. If we don't do something and do something quick, we're going to be in a world of hurt 10 years from now. That's why in South Carolina, we knew if a child couldn't read by third grade, they were four times less likely to graduate high school. So what we did is instead of pushing those kids forward, we started holding them back. We brought in their parents. We did reading remediation, and we set them up for success. We've got to do that all over our country. We have got to get our kids reading again. And no parent should ever wonder what's being said or taught to their child in the classroom. We need complete transparency in the classroom. We will require all curriculums have to be online so that parents can see them. And then we want to make sure that we understand that parents know what's in the best interest of their kids. And that's why parents should be able to decide which mode of education or which school their child goes to. Stop mandating education based on a zip code and start mandating education based on the fact that the parents know best and those kids deserve a good education. And then let's start building things in America again. Let's put vocational classes back into our high schools. In South Carolina, we taught our kids how to build the things we were making. We had apprenticeships all over our state. We got them invested in our economy even before they got out. That's what we have to do again. And then when it comes to the border... It doesn't even look like the United States of America anymore. It is a complete dereliction of duty. Now, when I was governor, we passed one of the, against what Donald Trump is saying on TV, we passed one of the toughest illegal immigration laws in the country. President Obama sued us over it, and we won. We're going to take what we did in South Carolina and we're going to go national with it. We're going to do a national E-Verify program and require every business prove that the people they hire are in this country legally. We're going to defund sanctuary cities once and for all. No more safe havens for illegal immigrants. We're going to put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. We're going to go back to the Remain in Mexico policy so that no one even steps foot on U.S. soil. And instead of catch and release, we're going to go to catch and deport. That's how we will stop what's happening on the border. And you know, when I was growing up, my parents always taught us, you take care of those who take care of you. I'm going to ask you if we're taking care of those who take care of us. Right now in America, over 35,000 of our veterans are homeless. One in three suffers from PTSD or thoughts of suicide. We lose 22 heroes a day to suicide. If a veteran needs a doctor's appointment at the VA, on average, it takes 29 days. Why 29 days? Because on the 30th day, they can go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. So midway through the 29 days, they get a call to reschedule, and the clock starts all over again. It's shameful how we treat our veterans. Now, I'm the proud wife of a combat veteran. He served in Afghanistan.
And when he came back home to us, that was a lot of prayers answered. But that was the easy part. When we got home, life got hard. Michael couldn't hear loud noises. He couldn't be in crowds. Life had passed him by for the year that he was gone, and the transition was tough. We can't just love our men and women when they're gone. We got to love them when they come back home too. You can't just say we're going to transition you for two weeks and then just let them go. We've got to take care of them for the long haul. That's why I think we need to have telehealth so they get the mental health care they need right when they need it. They should be able to go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. They've earned that right. And I think the way we deal with VA health care, I think every member of Congress should have to get their health care from the VA. And you watch how fast that gets fixed. It'll be the best health care you've ever seen, guaranteed. You know that. And speaking of Congress, don't you think it's finally time we had term limits in Washington, D.C.? Don't you think we need to have mental competency tests for anyone over the age of 75? Now, let me say this. I'm not being disrespectful when I say that. I don't care if you do it for 50 and up. I don't care if you do it for all of them. But right now, Congress is the most privileged nursing home in the country. These are people making decisions on our national security. These are people making decisions on the future of our economy. We need to know they're at the top of their game. We all know people that are over 75 that can run circles around us. And then we know Joe Biden. You know it's true. And there were two things at the United Nations that Russia, China, and Iran never wanted us to have. They never wanted us to have a strong military, and they never wanted us to be energy independent. We won't be energy independent. We will be energy dominant. We will pull back the EPA. They care more about sagebrush lizards than they do about whether we can afford our utility bill. We'll speed up our permitting. We'll start our pipelines, including the Keystone Pipeline. We'll export as much liquefied natural gas as we can. We'll do nuclear power. We will make sure we're not just doing enough to keep America strong. We will turn our energy sector into an economic powerhouse. That's what will bring inflation down. That's what will bring our economy up. But more than that, no more going hat in hand to Saudi Arabia and no more getting dirty oil from Iran or Venezuela. And then when it comes to our national security, the world is on fire, literally. We've got a war in Europe. We've got a war in the Middle East. We've got North Korea testing intercontinental ballistic missiles that can reach the U.S. You've got China on the march. But make no mistake, none of that would have happened had we not had that debacle in Afghanistan. The idea that my husband and his military brothers and sisters had to watch us leave Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies who stood shoulder to shoulder with us for decades because we asked them to be there. Think about what that told our friends. More importantly, think about what that told our enemies. And now what do you have Congress telling you? Do we support Ukraine or do we support Israel? Do we support Israel or do we secure the border? Don't let them lie to you like that. It's a false premise and they know it. I will always tell you the truth of what's going on. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you, hugely important. I don't think we should give any country cash, friend or enemy, because you can't follow it and you can't hold it accountable. I don't think we need to put troops on the ground. But I'll tell you, 
what you do need to know. If any of you are asking, why should we care about Ukraine? That's a legitimate question for you to ask. The infuriating part is no one is giving you the answers to that. And I am going to give you the answers to that. When I was at the United Nations, I saw every day Terrorists, dictators, and thugs always tell us what they're going to do. They're amazingly transparent. Hamas said they were going to go into Israel, and they did. China said they were going to take Hong Kong. We watched it during COVID. Russia said they were going to invade Ukraine. It happened. China says Taiwan is next. We better believe them. Russia said once they take Ukraine, Poland and the Baltics are next. Those are NATO countries that immediately puts America at war. This is about preventing war. This has always been about preventing war. And so we should be giving Ukraine the equipment and ammunition they need to win. Now, a further point on that, if we supported Ukraine, that's only 3.5% of our defense budget. That's it. The Europeans are paying more than that, and they should. It's their neighborhood. Now let's go to Israel and what happened on October 7th. For any of you asking why we should care about Israel, God help us if we don't get this one right. Israel is a bright spot in a tough neighborhood. They are the tip of the spear when it comes to defeating terrorism. It has never been that Israel needs America. It has always been that America needs Israel. And on that horrific day of October 7th, when Hamas came in and beheaded those people and burned those babies alive and took those girls from the concert and raped them and dragged their naked bodies through the streets of Gaza, what did they say? Death to Israel, death to America. That's why we have to care about what's happening in Israel. Now, if we supported Ukraine and we supported Israel, that's only 5% of our defense budget. Now, securing our border is priority number one. No more excuses. Right now, America's acting like it's September 10th. We better remember what September 12th felt like because it only takes one person for a 9-11 moment. <laughs> if we support Ukraine and we support Israel and we secure the northern and southern borders, that's less than 20% of Biden's green subsidies. So don't let them tell you that you have to choose. A president in Congress has to choose preventing war. A president in Congress has to choose national security. A president in Congress has to choose protecting Americans. That's the answer that they, they should have, not coming to you and acting like they don't have enough money. They have it. It's about priorities. Now let's talk about our number one national security threat. China has been planning war with us for years, and that's not an exaggeration. They're already here. They've already infiltrated our country. They bought 400,000 of, 400, of U.S. acres in land of our soil, most recently near Grand Forks Air Force Base, where our most sensitive drone technology is. They put millions of dollars into our university, stealing our research, spreading Chinese propaganda. Everybody got upset about that Chinese spy balloon, right? Now, South Carolina has beautiful beaches. That's not why that spy balloon went over. It's because we are a strong military state. And China said it was a weather balloon. Now we know it connected with U.S. Internet, picked up all of that surveillance, and sent it to China. But what about the fact that 90% of our law enforcement drones are Chinese? So now think of all the mini surveillance that's happening. There are certain technologies that build up China's military and threaten America. Yet the Biden administration approved 70 percent of them last year. The Trump administration approved more than that. And we've had more Americans die of fentanyl than the Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam wars combined. 70,000 Americans last year. And China's building up their military 
at a scary pace. They have 500 nuclear warheads. That's 100 more than they had last year. They've got the largest naval fleet in the world. They have 370 ships. They'll have 400 ships in two years. We won't even have 350 ships in two decades. They're doing artificial intelligence. They're doing cyber. They're doing space. They're doing hypersonic missiles. We've barely gotten started. And now China's the lead developer in neurostrike weapons, weapons engineered to change the brain activity of military commanders and segments of the population. That's who we're dealing with. So don't let Biden tell you that China's a competitor. I dealt with China every single day at the UN. They never saw us as a competitor. They always saw us as an enemy. We've got to start looking at them the way they look at us. So how do we deal with China? We start by stopping the sale of any U.S. soil and we take back the land that's already been purchased. We go to our universities and we say, you either take foreign money or you take American money, but the days of taking both are over and we get that infiltration out of our schools. We blacklist all of the technology we don't want them to have. And we tell China we're going to end all normal trade relations with them until they stop murdering Americans with fentanyl. You watch how fast they move. They need our economy. And then we build up our military. Strong militaries don't start wars. Strong militaries prevent wars. And that doesn't mean throwing a lot of money at the Department of Defense. It actually means cleaning it up, getting rid of the bureaucracy, getting rid of the red tape, telling them to quit playing favorites with defense contractors, getting all these programs that don't belong. I mean, for goodness sake, they have got to stop these gender pronoun classes. It is demoralizing our military. <laughs> to sum that up, there's a reason the Taiwanese want the U.S. and the West to support Ukraine. Because they know if Ukraine wins, China won't invade Taiwan. There's a reason the Ukrainians want the U.S. and the West to support Israel. Because they know a win for Iran is a win for Russia. China, Russia, and Iran are bound together in an unholy alliance. They are bound together in a hatred of freedom, of democracy, and above all things, the United States of America. We can take them on, but not by putting our heads in the sand, but by letting them know what we expect of them. So we have the answers to the domestic policy and the national security that we need to get America back on track. But before we do any of that, we've got to acknowledge some hard truths. Republicans have lost the last seven out of eight popular votes for president. That is nothing to be proud of. We should want to win the majority of Americans. But the only way we're going to win the majority of Americans is if we move forward with a new generational conservative leader and we leave the negativity and the baggage behind and go forward with the solutions of the future. <laughs> Now, another hard truth. I voted for Donald Trump twice. I was proud to serve America in his administration. I agree with a lot of his policies. But rightly or wrongly, chaos follows him. You know I'm right. Chaos follows him. And we can't have a country in disarray and a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. We won't survive it. Another hard truth for you to think about. It should send a chill up your spine to think about a President Kamala Harris. And if you look at those head-to-head -head polls, look at any of them. There's numerous. You look at the head-to-head -head polls. Trump and Biden, on a good day, are even. 
he might be up by two points. It's margin of error. It's going to be a nail biter of an election. We're going to end up holding our breath again. I'm in every one of those same general election polls. And I beat Biden by 17 points. Now that, so we show big gains in that. That last poll was a Wall Street Journal poll, and it was funny. Um, when Trump was throwing his temper tantrum the other night, he said, that was a dirty poll. That was a dirty poll. It was done by his pollster. <laughs> look, but if you look, at, but if you look, at, if, I, if I pull off a win of double digits, do you know what that means? That's bigger than the presidency. That's House, that's Senate, that's governorships, that's school boards. That's a really big change in our government. You go into D.C. with a double-digit win, that's a mandate to stop the wasteful spending and get our economy back on track. That's a mandate to get our kids reading again and go back to the basics in education. That is a mandate to secure our borders with no more excuses. That's a mandate for law and order back in our country, and that's a mandate for a strong America that we can all be proud of. Don't you want that again? Because we could have that again. But in order to have that, it's going to take a lot of courage from every single person in this room. Courage for me to run and courage for every one of you to know don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't play in this primary on Tuesday. It matters. Six months ago, I dropped my husband Michael off for another year-long deployment. And I watched him and 230 soldiers pick up their two duffel bags of belongings to go to a country they'd never been, all in the name of protecting America. They're willing to sacrifice their lives and their families because they still believe in this amazing experiment that is America. So if they're willing to sacrifice for us there, shouldn't we be willing to fight for our country here? Because we have a country to save. But I'm going to tell you right now, I have seen the commercials that you see. I have watched the rallies that they're showing on TV. I have even listened to the media and what they have to say. And what I have seen is through these temper tantrums, Donald Trump is telling a whole lot of lies. But if he's going to lie about me, I'm going to tell the truth about him. So to dispute some of these lies, he said that I never wanted a border wall. What I said is, I don't just want a border wall. I want all those other things I mentioned to secure our border, because we've got to do more than that. Then he turned around and said that I wanted to take away people's Social Security. I never once said that. Now, what has he said? He said he wanted to raise the retirement age to 70. He said that he, and he did this in 2018, proposed a gas tax increase on all of us of 25 cents. Everybody talks about the economy they had under Donald Trump. It's good, right? But at what cost? He put us $8 trillion in debt in four years. Our kids will never forgive us for this. That's not what you do. Ask an accountant. You don't run up the credit card to have a good economy. That's no different than Biden depleting our petroleum reserves to make you feel better about gas prices. You don't do that. You do the hard work. You do it the right way. You make sure you build up your economy. This decision that you're making on Tuesday, 
is a decision to decide, do we want more of the same or do we want to go forward in a different direction? More of the same is not just Joe Biden, it's also Donald Trump. 70% of Americans don't want to see a Donald Trump-Joe Biden rematch. The majority of Americans disprove of both of them. Look at their numbers, they're tanking. Both of those men have put us trillions of dollars in debt, and they have no vision for how to get us out of it. Both of those men are completely distracted with their own investigations and their own vengeance on people of the past that they refuse to talk about a vision of the future. We can't keep living like this, and you feel it. The reason I'm running, I don't want my kids to live like this. The division and the hatred and all of that. And you know what it comes down to? Joe Biden and Donald Trump are doing the same thing to all of us. They think a leader decides who's good and who's bad, who's right and who's wrong. That's not what a leader does. What a leader does is understand that you serve everybody and your job is to get people to see the best of themselves and go forward. That's how you lead. My approach is different. Politics is not personal for me. We don't have time for that. It's about results. People are tired of working for government. They want government to serve the people again. With me, you'll get no drama, no vendettas, no vengeance. You will get somebody that works every day to tell you everything I know. You won't have to search for answers. I'm going to put it all in front of you. I did that as governor. I did that as ambassador. You deserve that. And at the end of the day, we're going to do this together. But more than that, it's going to be something that gives our children hope and pride in the country that we're blessed to live in. When I announced I was running, they asked me why I was doing this. I said, my parents came here 50 years ago to an America that was strong and proud and full of opportunities. I want them to know that country again. I'm doing this for my husband, Michael, and his military brothers and sisters. I want them to know their sacrifice matters. I want them to know that we love our country. I'm doing this for my daughter who just got married, and I saw how hard it was for her and her husband to buy a home. The average home buyer in America now is 49 years old. The American dream is leaving them. And I'm doing this for my son who's a senior in college. And I'm tired of watching him write papers of things he doesn't believe in just to get an A. That is not us. That is not America. <laughs> and for the first time, 81% of Americans don't think their kids are going to live as good of a life as we did. We can't be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. We do have a country to save. But I'll promise you this, if you will commit to go out and vote on Tuesday, if you will take friends with you, if you will tell everybody that this is a movement that is going to finally change the direction of where we are in our country and where we are in the world, I promise you, 